for our generation and I've, I've loved just being a little part of it. You're about to head back to the station. Uh -huh. uh, tell us what it looks like, what modules are up there and, and what's changed since you last visited? Well, the good news is that just about everything that was intended to be put up on station is there, I'd say about 98%, uh, which is a tremendous feat. And the last time I was there in 2006, um, we were less than halfway. We've gone from three people to six people. Plus six on the shuttle when you get there. Oh yes, there'll be a crowd. Uh, there'll be 12 that's bashing around on station at that point. But um, I think it's important that with uh, the new labs and with six people on orbit, we now have roughly equivalent of uh, three full-time people just doing science and experiments. Up to now, it's been pretty much um, full-on assembly, full-on operations and repair. And from now on in, for the next at least 10 years, we're hoping, we'll be seeing a lot of science and tech development. What should we expect in the next decade? Well, some of the things they've been doing have uh, uh, involved uh, material science and combustion and things like that that can only be done in space. Another thing they've found is that when you take um, bacteria, things like salmonella and MRSA, uh, the strains become more virulent, more nasty. Because of the radiation, presumably? Uh, it's actually zero G, we think, actually drives the mutation rate, goes up a bit, and uh, there's so not much more selection, more generations. So you get nastier bugs quicker, which, which actually is useful because you can make better vaccines. Go for main engine start, main engine start, two, one, booster ignition, and liftoff of the space shuttle Discovery. Returning to the space On both of Piers' two previous flights, he was a spacewalker, taking an active role in the physical effort of constructing the space station. There's a long performance, as you put it, getting in, sealing yourself in, helmets, gloves, tools, equipment, and they stuff you in the airlock. And then there's another couple of hours of depressing the airlock very slowly, again, so you don't get the bends. And, and then, then you finally, the finally, someone says, OK, you're good to open the hatch. And you open the hatch and boof, there's the world. Quite beautiful, really quite beautiful. And then you have to get to work. Then you have to go to work. And uh, you know, you're working for Uncle Sam, after all. So I've got to get the job done. This is Mr. Control Houston. Pierce Sellers getting himself strapped into an articulating portable foot restraint so he can accept the old trailing umbilical system reel from Mike Fossum. What have been the, the really memorable moments about the, the spacewalk itself? Not just the Earth, but have, th have things gone wrong? Have there been things you're particularly proud of? I think, think on my second flight, we did a spacewalker, Mike Fossum and myself, where pretty well everything went wrong. We couldn't get a large piece of equipment to fit into its place on space station. It just wouldn't go and we resolved that. Then we couldn't get the dud spare, the, the, the broken part that we'd removed out of there, we couldn't get it stowed on the shuttle to bring home. Interestingly, it's, I don't feel it going inboard at all. I feel it going outboard. And eventually resolved that. Then I had problems. My uh, safer pack, my little jet pack, wanted to fall off and fly around by itself. Right, and that's, off your, back. that's your, your pack of <laughs> That's right, and then, uh, right. yep. So uh, Mike had to help me put it back on again. So it was a busy, it was a busy day. When we got back in, we just laughed. That is, once it was worse. Once we got back in, said, "Boy, that's just like a sim." Because <laughs> <laughs> when they try, and make when they try, try and break everything on you. Yeah. It's hard to practice for the weightless environment of space while down here on Earth, but the solution lies in this large swimming pool. This is the neutral buoyancy lab where we practice assembling the space station. Yep. The way we do it, we've got a full-size scale model space station, thrown it in the pool. And then we have old spacesuits or spacesuits that have been used for tests. We put our guys in there and we pressurize the suit so it's uh, just the amount, right amount of pressure that you would feel in space when you put yourself in the water. The suit sort of stiffens up mm -hmm. because of the air pressure inside the suit. And we weigh them out just perfect so they're just hovering in the water. And that's the closest we can get to a sensation of weightlessness and giving you all the problems and advantages of working in a weightless environment. Yeah, and what's your role today? Today I'm going to be driving the big arm, so I'm the crane operator. Suiting up for spacewalk training is fellow astronaut Garrett Reisman. Prior to Atlantis's flight, he'd already clocked up seven hours' experience as a spacewalker. One of the hardest things about doing a spacewalk is, is overcoming the suit. You don't really overcome the suit, you, you learn to work within its constraints. because. You know, we've kind of made the analogy a lot that it's kind of like trying to change the oil in your car by, while wearing a medieval suit of armor because the way this thing really restricts your motions. So, see, I can't raise my hands any higher than this. Uh, that's as high up, so I can't reach anything up by my head. 
And I got this range to working right here, but I can't reach behind me very well. This is about all I got. Preparations complete, the real work of the day can begin. The seven-hour session sees Garrett in the pool with peers coordinating the movements of the robotic arm from up in the control room. This is a model of the arm. The real one's about 65 foot long, but this is my more portable version. And it shows you all the ways that you can rotate and move around. Each of these is a joint. So it's quite complicated to do the, do the moves. It doesn't always want to go where you want it to go. The robotic arm is absolutely critical to the station's operation. Not only is it used to move pieces of the station around, but it provides a smooth ride for spacewalking astronauts. OK, please give me uh, about so we between 20 and 30 centimetres up. Stop motion. Well, let me just have about 10 centimetres left. 10 centimetres left, that's towards you. Right. Motion. Stop motion. Yeah, it's going to okay, be Okay, just Brakes are on. Errors made in the pool are embarrassing, but really no big deal. But the goal is to make sure that mistakes aren't made 300 miles above the surface of the Earth, where they may have more serious consequences. We're like little hamsters going around and around until we get it right. The great disgrace is smacking the station with the arm or hitting it with an astronaut or something. Try and avoid that. High priority. Just a few weeks after I met them, Piers joined his crewmates and their commander, Ken Ham, on what should be the final flight of Atlantis. They carried with them some of the final pieces of the International Space Station, the largest structure ever assembled in space. And now we are deep.